great thing about only filming the top half of your body is you can still have on your Christmas jammies. <laughs> on the bottom, it's great. Hi, hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess and today I'm talking about the top 10 nonfiction books I read this year. I already did my fiction list which I'll link uh, below or above or both. <laughs> so this is the nonfiction list and I am trifling so even though these are in my top 10 I don't own all of them. I do own some but they're downstairs and I'm up here and so I'll just put a picture on the screen. Nevertheless, this list was so much harder to put together than my fiction list. Like I was literally going back and moving ones out and I was like, no, I'll bump that one into the top 10. I'll put that one in honorable mention. So just know that I loved all of these and I do have some honorable mentions. I had a great nonfiction year this year and I hope to read even more next year, fingers crossed. So again, with my fiction list, I said they're interchangeable. I feel like the same goes for here. But anyway, we'll start with number 10, which is Fearing the Black Body by Sabrina Strings. This would be higher if I think I had read, had the physical along with the audio, because this author really traces the history of fat phobia, especially against black bodies. Going back to like, I can't think of the time, but she goes back to like, I think it's like pre-colonial times and in Europe. But she references a lot of art and I am no, art connoisseur or stuff like that and I know the book also just has a lot of images to go along with things she's talking about I think that would have been really helpful because overall I loved her argument and ideas but there were some moments where I was like wish I just had the visual imagery or even just pausing to read the words and being able to like tab it and make notes that would have helped me appreciate the story even better but I think it's still great I've read um, a couple of books this year that I've um, on my it's just an ever-evolving it's not like a journey I don't have a destination I think is it a destination I kind of do have it anyway trying to work on my own internalized fat phobia and so this is one of the books I read this year that really helped um, because it really just shows you a kind of history of how it started how some of that language and ideas started so long ago but have are still relevant in the present. People still use certain words or still think certain things about black bodies. And so um, all of these, I am eventually going to get a physical copy and I really want to do a reread, especially for this one. But I think that it is, I think this was in Mara's top and I forgot if she, every nonfiction book is not necessarily written to that, written in a way that is easily consumed. I felt like this, was more academic and maybe that's where I was being tripped up on some things because I'm not an I'm not smart I'm not an academic I've only got, gotten a bachelor's having gone to, to graduate school so I think that's another thing I think this was a more it was less narrative nonfiction, um, but I still really enjoyed it so that was number 10. And then number nine, and I know this seems weird that this is low on this list, but this is also one I'm going to reread actually next month. So Mediocre, The Dedrit, The Dangerous Legacy of White Male America. And so like I said, this one I'm going to be reading in January with my nonfiction book club book community read. It's all the information is always linked down below for the discord and the Twitter if you want to join us. So we're reading that in January, we'll have a live show in February. I read this earlier this year. And there are parts of it that still stick with me. But again, it was when I listened to didn't own the physical copy. So I'm going to be rereading it with the physical and I think that I will get a lot from it. But still, I still think of this one um, as a really great nonfiction book I read this year because it helped me I think a lot of these that are in my top 10 helped me learn something realize something like solidify something that I had as a thought and now I have a factual place to reference. And so especially she starts basically back in the beginning of, you know, America when the whites were, you know, taking over all of the land. And she starts back with like Buffalo Bill and like white people killing all of the buffalo 
to like present day. This came out this year. So she's covering like the election. And I was so confused with the Bernie Sanders supporter to Trump supporter pipeline. And she argues really well in this book about why that's a thing. Like how the Bernie bros became Trump bros. And it is so interesting. But essentially the book is about what the subtitle says. It's a legacy of mediocre white men from the beginning of this country to now and how not that it's only just <laughs> should be illegal um and, and it's ridiculous how little they have to do how you know like how much work they don't have to do they don't have to be that super successful like they can just be these basic basic ass dudes often with a lot of money because they're white men all of that privilege just gets them into all these positions and they are the reason our country is the way it is now and it doesn't just harm it harms everybody you know we all suffer because we continue to have these mediocre dudes running the country and so i can't wait to reread that one and see how my feelings um change about it or like how much more i get out of it the second time so again if you want to join us check out the discord um people can discuss in there together as a reading and then we'll have a live show in february at number eight i have ace what asexuality reveals about desire society and the meaning of sex by angela chin again another one i don't own and i think that i will get a lot more out of it once i purchase it and do a reread so this book obviously is about asexuality but it covers so much more because she talks about aromanticism and different things that based it's really u.s focused because she talks about things in our society in our country like how insurance works and different and taxes just different laws that are different if you're married and people who maybe are um a romantic like all of these different things that only benefit you if you are married in the united states and i had never thought about so many of these things like one of the greatest examples was talking about insurance so if you get married obviously you can put your children who are like 2600 on your insurance or your spouse but if you're single you aren't allowed to put your elder parent on it or like i don't know if you had a platonic relationship with a friend you're not allowed to put that person on your insurance like i never thought about how fucked up that is and she just addresses so many things i would never think of just because uh growing up in america and just the heteronormal the heteronormativity she talks about that a lot of just like everything like so many things and i loved how many different terms and just different ideas she opened in my mind and another reason I really want a copy is there were lots of like different terms for relationships and stuff and even though there's lots of terms her biggest thing was like I know this is a lot but like at the end of the day let people be who they are like whether they have no label or they have all of these labels if they say they are a romantic asexual in a queer platonic relation it doesn't matter as long as they're not harming anyone to respect their decisions their choices their identities and I was like oh my god especially learning about a queer platonic relationship not like not like it was it completely new i don't know but just so many things and i was like what and i loved it and so i really really want to reread this one because i think i can get just learn so much more um and there's of course there's things i've forgotten and i remember at first reading this and starting it because when she's starting out talking about asexuality and i'm just like like i know what exists but i never like really like looked into it and i think there's preconceived notions about people who are asexual and um i definitely had those and so at first i was like ugh, i don't want to listen to this and i felt like and i checked myself which i don't always do but since it was a non-fiction i checked myself and i'm like why why don't we like this why are we feeling this i felt uncomfortable because it was different from what i know and because they were talking i'm just like in my mind because i am not asexual i'm like i do not understand how someone doesn't look at somebody and feel you know sexual feelings because let me tell you about my mind okay i look at people and i'm like damn he is delicious oh she fooling you know what i'm saying like so in my mind <laughs> and not to say people don't notice notice attractive are not attracted to people but i also also think about them sexually <laughs> so i just thought that was the norm and so i think that's what was really pushing um like it was 
bothering me at the beginning but I was like all right I'm gonna keep listening and I'm glad I did so definitely going to revisit that one I'm gonna keep saying this again but um yeah highly recommend all of these but definitely if you just don't know much about asexuality if you have I'm sure a lot of us have those preconceived notions about what being asexual means you should check this one out Number seven is The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America by Richard Rothstein. Excellent, excellent book. I buddy read this with Elle, Joshana, and Monet. And basically, we had a group chat and we every every time we would send a message we was like like i knew this was a thing but now i really know and i'm angry like it was just like rage messages and i loved it. it was a great experience reading it with them and so i knew about certain things like redlining and and you know talking about like gentrification and stuff like that like i knew some basics about things with like neighborhoods and cities and how they were kind of socially and racially stratified but I didn't know this much and it really talks about that history and goes back to you know the civil rights time and maybe a little before I can't think of it I do have it downstairs I should have brought it up here but um again I read this one well I listened to it and then I got the book it didn't come until after I was finished but there's maps and like Im there's like images in it and just things talking about how they would like <laughs> just all the different ways they wanted to distance themselves from black people. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Like there was one example in California, I think, where there was a plant where all these people worked. And so they were like, oh, we're moving the plant away. And so like as to not want black people to come around there because they built, of course, new housing near the plant for people, of course, so they could move their families there, they could work there, but they didn't allow black people to live there. And so they would have to drive an hour or two each way to get there to work. And I just am like, I hate everything or where they had laws where you weren't supposed to sell they were like I think there were, may have been federal laws that prohibited you from discriminating against black people but then of course like locally or state laws were different and there was one scenario I apologize I read this earlier in the year so this might you know it may not be correct but there was one uh, example in the book where he was talking about it was a white neighborhood but one white person decided to sell their house without, I guess, like telling anyone or asking anyone to a black person, a black man and his family. And then the realtor, I guess, found out in that area and was like, oh no. So they started this whole thing. There's a term for it where they were like, uh oh, the Negroes are coming. We gotta go, we gotta get out. So everyone starts selling their house but they're selling them so hot they're like selling them for more money and then so black people are trying to buy houses so they have to buy houses at an even higher rate because they were living in these really terrible conditions it's just a fucked system then and now and it just really goes into the different ways laws were created um and even when a certain law said something that it necessarily wasn't always followed if it was supposed to be more about integration and just I mean, not all of these books on here were rage inducing because I did change it up a little bit. Like Ace wasn't a rage inducing read, right? I was uncomfortable at the beginning, but then a lot of it was just like enlightening. This was rage inducing. So be warned, but read it. <laughs> Coming in at number six is Somebody's Daughter by Ashley C. Ford. So this was a memoir. I feel like I read quite a few memoirs this year. I usually don't. But I kept like I've seen Ashley C. Ford's name on Twitter and I kept hearing about this one. So I think it was a Libro FM copy. So I listened to it. And one of the biggest things that connected with me, I'm going to just read you a line that I have from the book. It wasn't lost on me that I mostly spoke my truth in the spaces where my family was absent. And I felt that deep to my core because I don't feel like like while I love my family, I cannot I cannot talk about completely my 100% authentic self. Like I can be silly and you know, all those things, um, comfortable, but like certain topics and things I can't talk to them about or like, so that just hit hard with me. That was the big takeaway from this is I just felt seen. Um, and she talks about like the relationship with her mom and then you know various dating and now her now her, her now husband um 
and just talking. I don't know. It just felt like she was like a weird black girl like me. And yeah, I don't know. I needed that. So I don't I don't have a lot to say. It's hard to like I don't I don't rate memoirs, but it just has stuck with me. And I it's like, you know, you're not alone, right? But then when you read it, it's just different. So I like, I mostly spoke my truth in the spaces where my family was absent. And I hate that that is that way. And I know it's that way for so many people that you, you know, if you're home life isn't toxic enough that you avoid it. You know, when you go home, you have to be a different person or you have to hide a part of yourself. And I, I have to do that when I go home or even, you know, conversations on the phone or certain things come up. I'm like, just to keep the peace and maybe that's bad, but it, I think it's a, I don't know. I enjoyed it. She also talks about she, her father was in prison for a lot of her life. So she was talking about that experience and like, <sighs> I can't relate to that, but it just, I don't know. I can't, I can't, I can't explain the full ways in which I connected with this without exposing too much of my business on the internet. And I'm not gonna do that. Just know that as a black girl, a weird one, I identified with this story and I really enjoyed it. So if that sounds at all enticing from the little bit I gave you, I think you, I think it's worth read or listen. She narrates audiobook, which I enjoyed. So there you go. <laughs> this feels low, but still incredible book. Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty by Patrick Radden Keefe. I recently finished this one um, for nonfiction November phenomenal, rage inducing, so be warned. But the Sackler family, if you have seen any news lines, news lines, news headlines recently, are the family responsible for creating OxyContin. And uh, they own a company called Purdue Pharma, but they have been this and this traces the history back like to the fathers who started the company. They have been strategic, and sneaky and shady and how they have kept their family name separate from Purdue Pharma, which is the company that created OxyContin, which was their biggest thing. They created other things, but this has been their biggest drug, like billions of sales and dollars. And the big thing with OxyContin is that their biggest marketing push and phrase with that was that it's not addictive. You cannot become addicted to this drug and you can and it has created a massive opioid crisis and it's uh it's so expen like once you uh are on the radar of like a pharmacist or something and you can't get it or it becomes too expensive a lot of people go to heroin so it is it is a crisis there's another book about this crisis called dope sick and now there is a show on hulu i think that's uh is it like a dramatis, dramatized version of Dope Sick? But so this was just going really into the history of the family and how like all of these things they learn in various other dealings and then them creating OxyContin and how that all affected it and the way they had F people from the FDA in their bag and like the ways they lied and you know squashed the truth and the way they made so much money that when they were sued or somebody you know tried to get them to have any accountability they were able to squash these things by selling out of court or settling under this other company they own so it wasn't tied to this company like it's so shady it's so awful but recently at the end of the book, you like find out a recent decision by a court case. So mad. But in the news, there's a glimmer of hope. So I don't want to say, I mean, if you've seen the news, then you've seen it. But I don't want to say it. if you haven't, I want everyone to read it. And while this focuses on the Sackler family, it is a perfect uh, example of America and its problem one of its many problems with especially corporations because in America often if a corporation like Exxon or Purdue Pharma or something make um, I was gonna say make a mistake have these huge things that cause 
you know, major disasters, obviously Exxon and like a huge oil spill or them creating icy content and lying about how it's not addictive. And it is now we have this crisis. The problem is it's always the corporation, but the corporation is run by people. But often the people can get out of it because they are literally not the name. Like they're like, well, it's the corporation who's being sued, not us. So they get away with a lot of shit. And I hate it. I hate it so much. <sighs> anyway, you should read this book. <laughs> but it was great. That's why it's Number five, and I don't know what else to say. Let me calm down. If you go look on Goodreads, you'll probably see most of these have five stars and you're like, I don't know, I'm not good at rating nonfiction. A lot of them get four or five stars for me. Like it takes a lot for you. <laughs> it takes a lot for you not to get that, but I think it's also because I'm so new to nonfiction. So a lot of these things, um, I think as time goes on, maybe I can become more critical, but right now, I'm like, wow, I learned five stars. <laughs> so at the number four, I have Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present by Harriet A. Washington. And so when this was published was 2006. So um, that's where it was. That was the present that was being uh, referenced. But reading this in 2021, still very, it's not like out of date obviously because things have only what <laughs> gotten worse um I mean some things are better I guess what but like it says I feel like a lot of the subtitles explain what it is and so I don't need to really tell you what it is just like why I loved it and again it feels weird saying I loved it when it's talking about experimentation on black bodies because this was not an enjoyable thing to read um I had to pace myself and read parts you know and then be like okay I'm putting that down for the day I'm gonna go read something happier because it is hard to read there's lots of descriptions about these experiments that were done on black people from slavery to modern day and I mean mm, there's so much I loved that she starts this, the story talking about like a, a misconception or just like kind of a general thought in, uh, amongst black Americans and maybe even other people who are not black is that black Americans biggest hang up with like the medical institution and not trusting the government is the Tuskegee ex experiment. And no, that's not it. It definitely is a part, but it's not it. And like, of course, I know about Tuskegee. And I knew about maybe, you know, obviously, I knew slaves were not treated well, but I didn't know about so much. So much I did not know about that she goes through in this book. It is chunky. It is a lot. Um, again, you got to pace yourself. But like, just knowing um, that some I don't know if it was during slavery, like right after a lot, of, I think it was slave owners who like had insurance on their slaves, because, you know, they got sick, they wanted their money. And the way that doctors would experiment on them and ways procedures were, were practiced and perfected on black bodies, and then only done to white bodies once they knew the procedure, you know, was perfected. So but at the same time of them holding these views that our bodies are gross and more prone to diseases and very animal like and all these things so you can perfect the surgery on us. So now that you've got the surgery, but now it's good enough to do on the white person, but we're still not good enough. I don't get it. It doesn't make a lot of sense. She talks about them um, using parts of the Bible to justify why we were meant to be enslaved. We couldn't do things on our own. We would, you know, <sighs> all of those things then she talks about in prisons all of the experiments they did then of course not just to black men but talking about how the black men in prison were definitely a higher percentage based on like the population amounts and I mean from plutonium and radiation experiments she talks about a lot of black women that got hysterectomies that did not ask for them they just sterilized them on their own <sighs> It's a lot. I learned so much from it. And it makes a lot more sense to me. Um, more people's hesitation. Because again, another thing is she explains in the book that is often told or thought wrong about Tuskegee is that the government gave these men syphilis. And it wasn't it was that they already had syphilis, but that this government, what is it, the public health office or whatever the government wanted to study 
the process of syphilis and how it basically ravaged the body and so they told them they were getting treatment but they weren't and so I can understand though especially in some areas and depending on how you grew up or what your family members have been through because some of this stuff is still very recent that you would distrust right now with like the COVID vaccine it makes sense I understand the hesitation in the beginning so I think this book I said in my review that I think everyone I mean I think everyone needs to read it but especially if you're going into healthcare, like of any 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 branch any smidgen of healthcare, I feel like people need to read this so they can be better providers to understand any like concerns or worries that black patients may have because of things that um our people our ancestors have experienced in this country before so maybe read a happy romance then read this then read a happy romance then read empire pain you know you gotta break it up you can't read them back to back like i did from the top three wow i've been talking for a while number three the new jim crow mass incarceration in the age of color blindness by michelle alexander she wrote this i think 11 years ago in 2010 and then in the edition I read there's like an update reflecting on this book 10 years later and I mean it's still very relevant so another book that is actually in my uh spoiler alert it's in my honorable mentions um ref talks about this book and said their only complaint about it was that it's just very U.S. centered instead of the world but that's like the point um so this the new you know Jim Crow was an era but this is talking about now how there is the new Jim Crow with prisons and like a school to prison pipeline in America and how prisons are predominantly made up of black and brown people and especially black and brown men um she goes into so much in talking about the growth of prisons I can't remember the exact statistics but like I think she talks about the 70s or 80s and how many prisons just like prisons there were in prisoners versus now and all of the companies that are involved in prisons and the the ways that the system does not make it easy to like get out of that cycle just even if you go to prison on something small because so many people I think she talks about how many people in prison are not there for are are in prison for nonviolent crimes and if you get out but then all the things you have to do for probation if you have an ankle monitor and you have to get a job and you can't live in these certain areas and how all of that again sets them up and mostly black or brown people who may not have the resources or if your family lives in this part of town that you're not allowed to now live in and you don't have they don't have money or resources to get you somewhere else to live or a connection to get you a job because of course you need a job and then if you check that you were incarcerated then you can't get a job but if you don't get a job then you're violating probation like what are you supposed to do <sighs> a cycle that is ex oh I hear a pitter patter is that a baby oh there's a people hello baby hello tell them happy new year <laughs> what y'all doing no you can't eat my giraffe you got one downstairs high five Thank you, boo boo. <laughs> Bye, boo boo. That interlude is over. <laughs> Anywho's, so essentially, incarceration, the prison industrial complex, is a new form of Jim Crow laws, which were a new form of slavery. And if you want to question me, don't. And just go read this book instead. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna give y'all a pass on this one because it only came out in October, but it only has 253 ratings on Goodreads, and <laughs> that's a problem. So that the number two spot is Bad Fat Black Girl. Notes from a Trap Feminist by Cecily Bowen. Now I am not. I feel like you're like Jessica. You a Trap Feminist? I would not say I am. I don't listen to a lot of trap music but something about this book just like even more so than somebody's daughter where if I had to choose who I legitimately like relate to more like we probably are more similar probably would be Ashley C. Ford but this and how it was written just it was like a, it was like a gospel 
being spoken to me. So Cecily Bowen, I had not heard of her, but she has been um, an activist for a while and works. Obviously, she's a trap feminist. And so she talks about feminism, but from the lens, like using trap music and really talking to black women who are comfortable in their blackness in who don't who aren't on the journey of maybe self realization, um, who maybe what she's because the title bad fat black girl was like, there she talks about there's like the thick bodies, you know, or the, the certain bigger bodies that people like because they're a, a nice shape you know like they look good maybe their butt is big and they have a stomach but it's like you know this little stomach and maybe they don't have a lot of arms it's just different like they have nice all these different proportions that people are like oh that's a plus size girl and she's cute but then so she's saying like I'm not built like that I'm a bigger girl but maybe my butt isn't as big and you know I have arms like these things like right in the media we see like Ashley Graham but she's like this proportionate, perfect, proportionate plus size model, obviously, right? And so she was like, she wrote this for the regular degula schmegula girls, or the girls from the hood, or the girls, and I'm not from the hood. I'm definitely not from the nice area of town either. It was just the, you know, we can afford to live here, but it's not the hood hood. Do you know what I'm saying? But it also wasn't like middle class. I no you know what whatever we had a home so that's all that matters but just something this so I listened to the audiobook which is recorded by uh her and I mean it was just like sis talking to me a-a-v-e she she does use the n-word which I don't use in my I don't use but like I don't it doesn't bother me hearing it when it's obviously a black person and just it just felt like I was talking to like a cousin or I was at the like I was listening to it it was like I was at the salon under the dryer somebody's talking like it just felt like relatable like I knew her like it was comfortable it wasn't like somebody's daughter is definitely written different this one is just written I feel like it's like in conversation but it is telling like a story it is like a memoir um it's hard to explain it's so short but it's just like to the point and she ugh, so much talking she talks about um also with the black community and the way homosexual homophobia is in the black community and you know stuff with the black church and also different problems that she had with her mom and different things that she went through um trying to put herself through college and her experience as a sex worker and talking about sex work and um some of the differences between like sex work and i can't was she talking about like trafficking um it and so many of these things I do not in my real life relate to. I have not done sex work. I have, you know, like I, um, I think at one point she was arrested for something. I've never been arrested, but it just felt, I don't know. Like she was just talking to me like we've been friends for years. That's how it felt. It just felt good. And that's why this is so high up here, especially when she was talking about, I, I, when people talk about, especially black women talk about their relationship with their mom, I'm like, when it's not perfect, because that has been my experience. Um, and I love my mom, but we just have had our moments and it's still, she's still not someone, like I said earlier, that I could be my full authentic self in front of, or like, you know, tell her every part about myself. Um, and so this is another one that that was one of the big things for me, but it just hit home more than somebody's daughter. And then she was talking about being, like she was talking about different like relationships things and being queer and I was like, she just, it was like a big sister. Like we were having a conversation. It was as if, I'm the oldest, I don't have any older sisters, but it's as if she was my older sister and we're both grown now and we went out for drinks and we're just shooting the shit and talking about, yeah we love mama but she crazy and she don't understand and this is what i do and it just felt like she like we were besties 
and so maybe in the educational standpoint and technicality and writing or something the other one should technically be higher on this list but for the way I just I had to put this one I had to I had to put this one up there it's just yeah she saw it's like she sees me I don't know I don't know how to explain it <laughs> I just think even non-black women or non-black femmes could benefit from this. It's all black. <sighs> this one is not a memoir, but it is definitely one that has stuck with me since I finished it. And I also buddy read this one, um, but just with L. And it was Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City by Matthew Desmond in the number one spot. Whew man man how much I didn't know so before I read this I definitely had ideas and thoughts about people who were evicted or became homeless and then reading this I learned so much about the amount of things that landlords are allowed to do and again the way systems in America make it hard to leave the cycle of poverty like I don't know if he says it in this book or if I've just heard it before but it's very expensive to be poor the author of this story I don't know how many years it was he spent time living in these communities to just see how people lived see how renters interacted with landlords and how the landlords you know thought about renters and stuff and just were following these people in their everyday lives and struggles and from different homes they had to move in and out of and oh my god it was like I w it was one of those where I had to like take breaks like make myself like okay I'm pausing here because I can't I can't take this anymore but rent or landlords are allowed to rent people homes in these conditions where they're not safe where things aren't working where they're infested with bugs and then if some tenants feel you know enough to speak up about it then they find a reason to evict them then they have an eviction on their record and then another apartment doesn't want to rent to them some of these places were like you can't have kids and oh my god oh my god this woman and the reason she would like end up in a shelter and I think he like went with one woman he was following he said something like she'd applied to like something ridiculous like 60 or 70 places and she was ended up sharing like a one bedroom apartment or something with this lady and it was so bad and he describes it and I just was like I'm going to be sick I can't take this anymore I think a lot of the nonfiction I read this year showed me just how terrible America is like I knew it but now it's like extra confirmed and I have the receipts do you know what I'm saying and so this one was just heartbreaking um he also talked about how like um one woman she was at work and her son I think he was acting out and maybe had hit, hit a teacher and like ran out of the classroom so the teacher called the cops so the cops went to the apartment so then the landlord didn't like that so she got kicked out of the apartment mm, some about domestic violence like people don't call the cops because then if they call the cops then it's on their record because the landlord is mad because they had to pay some fee for them to come out or something it it is asinine it is terrible but it is such a reflection of America again it's very expensive to be poor it's very hard to remove yourself by yourself from the cycle of poverty it is very hard to get ahead when you have to do this over and over when you have to make a choice between paying your rent or having your electricity on in Chicago because oh wait a note this takes place in Milwaukee so this is cold Milwaukee Wisconsin um so you have to make a choice like some of them were talking about well I'm gonna pay my heat 
so I don't freeze but then now they're behind on their rent and then there's a fee on top of that and then the next month's rent comes due and it's just a vicious cycle that a lot of people cannot get out of. Well contrary to what Americans would have you believe that it's not necessarily how hard you work and it's a lot about luck or circumstance or privileges it's a whole mix of things but it's not just you work hard and you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I feel like for this list I don't know if I did a good job of telling you about these but I feel like I don't know nonfiction is kind of hard to tell you like the titles kind of give you like what it's about but like everyone's not going to connect or resonate with a story like someone else um all of these are you know in various stages of what kind of like some things were more narrative nonfiction where it definitely reads more like a fictional story so I think it's easier to digest and some were more like academic like The Fearing the Black Body but all of them I learned so much from and definitely will be revisiting. Holy crap I have 51 minutes talking about nonfiction. I've had such a good nonfiction year. If you've read any great nonfiction books that I didn't mention or if you did read any of these and you enjoyed them please let me know down below or if any you have that you think I would enjoy please let me know but thank you so much for watching this. I hope you've been having a wonderful holiday season. Give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, check out the description. I'll link all the books below and I hope you are blessed, hydrated, moisturized, and sunscreen and I'll see you in my next one. Bye!